My name is Darissa Vincentini and I work for the Invasive Species Center and the Community Science Coordinator. So I mostly do kind of outreach with the public and coordinate community science programs similar to our Hemlock Willi Adelgid Monitoring Network um, and just kind of help spread the word about invasive species and what people can do about them. Um, and today I'm joined by uh, Nicole from CFIA and Victoria from NRCAN as well as kind of, you know, the people who have the most knowledge on HWA. <laughs> so I'm not going to be talking too much. I'm just here to help facilitate um, and then I'll pass it off to them. Um, but before we get started, if you haven't you know, already been to the washrooms, they're just out this door here and a left down this hallway and you'll navigate. There's two washrooms there. Um, and just so you know, this whole kind of workshop is informal. Um, you know, we have slides and content that we think you're going to be interested in but really it's an opportunity for you to ask your questions. So feel free to, you know, raise your hand and whenever and ask your questions. Um, and it, it will be more of a discussion rather than just presentations. Um, and we're gonna have, actually I'll move the next slide. Maybe, there we go. Um, so this is kind of like the setup of the day. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk just about where you can get some of the resources that will be talked about today um, and then we're going to go over the biology and current research and then the current status in Ontario and Canada, as well as uh, surveillance by CFIA. And then we're going to have a quick health break um, where you can enjoy some snacks. There is coffee and uh, juice over there as well. If you prefer tea, the kettle is on. Just let me know. Um, and then there's also a bunch of HWA resources on the table um, for you to uh, get yourself and bring home and browse as well. Um, and all those resources are also available on our website. So there's an online version. Um, and then after that health break, we're gonna get into some community monitoring techniques and how um, there's several different techniques that you might be able to implement in your organizations or on your woodlot. Um, and all of them have their pros and cons and different resources that you need. So you know, there's lots available. Um, so we'll go over each of those. Then we're gonna have another health break um, and in that health break is when we are going to kind of pack all of our stuff up and then all of us will drive over to the field site um, for a field tour. Uh, yeah, so that's how the days can go. If you're not familiar with the Invasive Species Centre, we are a not-for-profit organization um, that connects stakeholders, knowledge and technology to help prevent the spread and introduction of invasive species across Canada. So that's why we're kind of here and involved. Um, on our website, like I said, there's tons of resources. Um, it's kind of a nice one-stop shop for invasive species resources. We have a best management practices database. Um, you can find, you know, all sorts of best management practices on there, not just ones that we've helped created, but across North America. Um, there's species profiles for specific uh, resources on individual species, um, video resources as well. There's a newsletter. Um, we have a quarterly newsletter on kind of new developments on invasive species. And then we also have a bi-weekly media scan um, that kind of goes over any invasive species in the news. Um, and like I mentioned, so we have species profiles, kind of the, the most prominent species on the landscape that we get the most questions about. All of the introductory questions are answered in there. And then there's also a number of resources and research um, papers listed underneath each of them including how luckily adult So like I said, um, all of the resources that we have here in physical form, we also have online if you're looking to find them online to share with either your colleagues or neighbors as well. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a number of databases. So the best management practice database is probably um, the most useful or not the most useful, but the most commonly used um, when you're looking to see what management plans to make for your own woodlot. Um, there's also a risk assessment database and a pathways risk ass assessment database to kind of help inform any prioritizing or strategy plans. Uh, we also have a YouTube page and this includes any videos that we've created, but also any of our previous webinars. So we have a monthly webinar series where we invite experts to come and talk monthly. So if you've missed anything, um, you can go to our YouTube channel and kind of learn about different topics. Um, this does include two recently um, presented HWA material or webinars. Um, so if you're looking to share some of this information with your colleagues, um, you can also send them to those webinars. Oops, too fast. 
Um, we also recently launched the Invasive Species Training Program. Um, and right now it actually primarily focuses on invasive forest pests. Uh, we have three courses currently available and that includes invasive forest pest training. So a little kind of overview of a couple invasive forest pests and then one specifically uh, on oak wilt. And then just this month we released a new spotted lanternfly training program as well. Um, and there are discount codes for, um, you know, if you're gonna have a couple of your team members join and take these courses. Um, there's also discount codes for uh, indigenous people or people of color and students as well. So, um, and it's also available as a ISA credit or continuing credit program as well. Um, and every year we're trying to add one or two per uh, course. Um, so to stay up to date when a new course is available, there's also a sign up sheet. And that's it for my kind of introductory where you can find things. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Victoria to kind of get into the biology. Tethered over here. I know. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Victoria Derry. I'm a forest health biologist at the Canadian Forest Service. Oh, I'm going to have that one. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, and we're back. <laughs> um, I work at the Canadian Forest Service at the Great Lakes Forestry Centre in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Um, so primarily, I'm working on research projects and um, writing some papers and programs that uh, all have to do with hemophilia adelgid for the most part. I do one other program that kind of works with uh, bugworm, but for the invasive species part of it, I mainly work with hemophilia adelgid. So right now, I'm just going to go over a bit of the background of what hemophilia adelgid is, um, the invasion history, uh, then we'll get into some of the biology. I'll go over some of what we know about the life cycle, the signs and symptoms you'll be looking for, um, some of the movement vectors, and then get into some of our ongoing research and projects, because some of those products will be useful to you in the future. So what is hemophilia adelgid? It's an invasive aphid-like insect that attacks eastern hemlock. Um, it feeds at the base of needles and feeds on those nutrient-filled fluids and tissues and then kills infested hemlock in about three to ten years. Um, it is considered to be native slash endemic in British Columbia, um, where it feeds on western hemlock. Um, and it's basically just through the natural predators there, it's kept at a level where it's not considered to be invasive, even though it was technically introduced a long, long time ago at this point. So the host species in Eastern Hemlock, it's a very shade tolerant, long lived tree. It's found near water with yellow birch and maple. It's about 1% of Ontario's growing stock um, with an average harvest of about, of about 20,000 cubic feet per year. Um, it's typically used for barn side and canoe paddles, um, other specialty products, but isn't commonly used as like a typical lumber. Um, it provides really important ecosystem services though. So um, bank stabilization, shades for streams, and very important deer habitat, and it creates a microclimate underneath of the canopy. So the invasion history of hemophilia adelgid uh, it was introduced to Eastern North America back in the 1940s. Um, you can see on this map, it shows the native range of hemlock in gray, and then it's overlaid with the invasion history. So the dark blue is kind of where it started, and then it spread. So as it gets into the lighter blue, that's a little bit more recent, into the greens and the yellows, which are the most recent. Um, so you can see up here, we have our few spots in south, southwestern Ontario. I don't think this is totally up to date to include the most recent find. There is, I think it's in the back. So just right in the tip of uh, Lake Ontario down. Yeah, okay, perfect. So it is there. That's great. And then Nova Scotia, it's actually about in about 50% of the province there. 
And this is an older map, just sort of showing the same thing and the significant expansion that we've seen since uh, the year 2000. So the biology. Chemically, delgid is one of the more complicated insects, unfortunately, for its life cycle and biology. So there are two generations per year. There's the cystins generation, which is born sort of late spring, early summer, and grows throughout the rest of the summer, fall, winter, and then it lays its eggs in early spring, which is then the progridians generation. And then that generation grows very quickly just through the spring months. Um, as you can see here, the progridians generation, the adults, about 50% of the adults will become these winged adults, but they don't persist in um, North America because we don't have the secondary species, um, which is a tiger tail spruce. So that generation would reproduce sexually on tiger tail spruce, but we don't have that host. So here we only have the asexual generation that persists and contributes to the growing population. Um, the systems generation is unique in that it estivates for a period of time in the late summer, kind of into the early fall. So basically after it hatches, the crawlers, which is the only mobile stage, crawl up the shoots, settle among the new growth, they insert their mouth parts and then they immediately go into estivation. So there's a period of time where they're not doing anything. Um, and then they'll break estivation kind of pop back up again and start feeding and then go through four nymphal stages before coming, becoming adults. So basically what you can see here is that the spring is your most common time for moving this insect. It is the most high risk time. So the crawlers are the only mobile stage or you can move eggs. Because it re reproduces asexually, um, <clears throat> It really only takes one. It can take just one ovisac of eggs or one crawler that moves into a stand. And if it manages to attach and survive, then it can reproduce and over the years create its own subpopulation in that stand, unfortunately. So signs and symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid infestation include um, the insects themselves on the twigs, they're very, very hard to see with the naked eye, though, because they're incredibly small. They're less than 1.5 millimeters, and 1.5 millimeters is about the size they are when they're adults. So all those nymphal stages are much smaller. They produce a waxy wool-like ovisac during development, which you can see in this photo. And that is probably the most um, obvious sign of hemlock woolly adelgid. It will only be along the twig itself at the base of needles. So anything that you're seeing attached to the needle itself um, is most likely like bird poop, sap, um, maybe a spider ovisac. Once you see it, if you are joining us in the field this afternoon, so late morning, early afternoon, whatever time it ends up being, <laughs> um, is that once you see it, it's very obvious what it is. And once you have that in your brain, it's kind of difficult to think that something else looks like it. <laughs> so you're also looking for premature dieback, thinning, a grayish cap, crown, and then any signs of discolored foliage. The main movement vectors of hemlock woolly adelgid are humans, whether that's us, going through and not decontaminating ourselves properly before moving into another stand or moving uh, woody materials that are infested, which is also included in nurseries. Nurseries can be a spot that it gets in and then gets planted and then spreads from there. Although CFIA tries to prevent that as much as they can. And then the main movement vector for this is actually birds, which is very difficult to control and prevent from it moving the insect. Um, and obviously it's most mobile during spring migration, which just aids in its movement. So it's very difficult to prevent that vector. So any questions on the biology before I move on to 
some of our research projects and things that you should look out for? Yes. Um, if it's controlled naturally in the West, mm -hmm. whatever it is that's controlling it, can that be introduced to the East? So, <laughs> or is that going to be another? Yeah, so there is a lot of research going into that because um, there are biological controls out there that help to keep the population down. However, most of the control is from, uh, in some of the areas that it's found anyways, is the cold. The cold. Yeah. So it has a hard time surviving for multiple days at like minus 20. Um, and actually in Grafton, we did see a decent amount of cold mortality this year. Um, mind you, we didn't get to do a full look at it, but from what we've seen so far, it looks like there was a decent amount of cold, amount of cold mortality. Nova Scotia also sees that, but Nova Scotia is so far gone in a way. <laughs> There's so many insects there that um, my coworker there always describes it as like there's trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of insects and even with 90 to 95 percent cold mortality there's still trillions and trillions and trillions of insects that did survive so it's very difficult to get a full cold mortality and the other thing although it's asexual it's not as um likely that it will happen there could become sort of those individuals that do survive and persist there could be some sort of adaptation that occurs in Canada so that those cold individuals are the ones that are sur cold tolerant individuals are the ones that are surviving. So there is a lot of research going into biological controls. Um, in Ontario, we just aren't there yet um, to actually start doing any sort of research and release. We have to do our own research. I think Nova Scotia is going to try soon to start doing some of the biological controls. Uh, but yeah, we're just not there yet, unfortunately. <laughs> so the goals for our research out of my lab are to develop monitoring and mitigation tools and tactics, identify areas of risk and prepare stands for HWA arrival and develop management tools. So all of what I do is um, basically the research it takes to develop these tools and then those can go into make other groups to make management decisions. So yourself to make a management decision for your woodlot, um, other areas of government to make management decisions of how they're going to use, they control it as a whole for a provincial look or a federal look. So I'm going to go over our silviculture and management guides, um, some phenology research and the insecticide trials. Those are our ongoing projects that we are currently working on this year. So the silviculture management guides, those are coming very, very soon. We have a literature review that was written in um, partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forest Forestry that will be in the uh, Forestry Chronicle, hopefully very soon. And from that, we have built um, a tech note that is sort of a pocket guide slash partner guide to go with the Ontario silviculture guide. So I don't know if any of you are managing woodlots on that scale for harvest that you use the Ontario Silviculture Guide to inform your woodlot management, but that would go along with that piece. And then for the smaller landowners, the conservation authorities, the people who aren't necessarily managing their woodlot for harvest, um, we have been working with the Invasive Species Centre to create sort of a management guiding document. And this document presents um, some background knowledge that you need, some options that you should consider for prevention, some options that are available to you for control, um, other resources that are available to you. And this document is meant to be a living fluid document that we are going to regularly update if we get new sites that are found. Um, CFIA is going to help us out by providing us with those maps as soon as they can so we can update that. Um, if anybody decides to try one of the management techniques and has data they want to share or case studies they want to share, we will include that in the document. Um, and then it has appendices in it of uh, pesticide, the PMRA labels, um, protocols for different detection and monitoring techniques that you can use so that you can take all of those tools and then adapt them for your use um as best like to whatever you need to do in your woodlot and your scale 
Um, so that one I'm hoping is going to be very useful for a lot of you in the future. Um, we do have a like kind of sneak peek that's out on the table from it. Um, I think it's out there. Is it? Okay. So there is, if it's not there, we will find it and put it up later, but there's a table I put in there that compares all of the um, monitoring options that you have and sort of gives like a relative cost, some of the pros and cons to consider so that you can help, you can pick the best techniques for your stand um, because some of them don't work very well, which we will go over in certain um, landscapes, for example. Some are very expensive and some are very affordable. So the age of phonology in Ontario. Um, I wanted to put this slide up just to show you sort of what it looks like when we're doing our phonology um, laboratory work. So we take samples, take them back to our quarantine facility. All of the insects are live. It's a um, certified facility through CFIA. It's very safe. We're not spreading anything at that point. We're in bunny suits the whole time. <laughs> it's very fun. Um, and we use the microscope to look at shoots that are about that big off the end of the branches. Um, and we're counting the number of eggs there are, uh, how many nymphs there are, how many adults there are at any time that are alive. And this helps to inform us when we're starting to see the first crawlers, the first nymphs, the first adults, the first ovisacs that actually have eggs in them. Um, and then from there, it helps us to advise when the highest risk time is for moving exactly, like what the temperatures are that you're looking for um, or that you could move the insect. And it also helps to inform certain management techniques, especially things like um, pesticides or in the future when we get into biological control, um, some of those insects feed on the adults and some of those insects feed on the eggs. So all those sort of release times have to coincide. So the phenology research this year, we are doing field collection from two sites in Ontario. Um, the Short Hills infestation, which is where we were yesterday, which is in Pelham, which is sort of just southwest of St. Catharines. And then Class Camp Grafton, which is where we'll be going to today. This is ideal for us to have two different sites in different parts of the provinces because, or the province, because we are getting different um, climatic variables to deal with in each location. We are taking 10 branch samples from each site. The branches are about this big. I will be doing some collection there when we are there today. Um, twice per week from April to June. So that coincides with that progredience generation that's very fast growing. We need to get frequent sampling because we could otherwise miss the start of um, seeing eggs, seeing crawlers, seeing all of those life stages. And then twice per month from July to October. In the past, we have done some research on the winter. It's pretty boring <laughs> because you're kind of just seeing the same, the same, the same, the same, and then it just very slowly growing. In the lab for the progridians generation, so because we will be getting a little bit of both, we'll be looking at the timing of all of the different life stages, when they start, when they end. For the systems generation for this project, we will be looking at the timing of the crawler hatch, the settling, and the estivation. So those are sort of the gaps in the knowledge we have in Ontario currently. Insecticide trials, um, I will do my best to speak to this research, but I'm not directly involved with this. It's other people in my lab. Um, these have been go ongoing for a few years now. It started with um, a Zytec trial where there was no hemlock woolly adelgid in the Petawawa research forest. Um, this is to evaluate the fate and translocation in hemlock and the soil of the actual insecticide. Then we moved on to um, in the Wayne Fleet infestation, which is also in the Niagara area, doing a Zytec and Triazin trial. Um, this is on HW infested trees. So this is to evaluate the impact of the, the combination of these um, pesticides on HWA populations in Wayne Fleet with three scenarios applied. Zytec alone, Triazin alone, and both of them in combination. So one is a spray, the Zytec is a spray, and Triazin is injectable. And that's it for our current research. Uh, if you have any questions, ask them now, or I can answer them later. 
Um, but from now, we will move on to the current status in Canada. Nicole. <laughs> okay, hi there. My name is Nicole Mulekjak. I am the Ontario Plant Health Survey Biologist for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So while Canadian Forest Services do a lot of research to be able to build those tools for managing and detecting these insects, Canadian Food Inspection Agency is a science-based regulatory organization that completes surveillance activities to help determine the size and the area that populations are within, and then we place regulatory controls on those areas to try to limit the spread through human-mediated movement. So I'll touch a little bit on the regulatory controls, but mostly I'll be discussing um, our current status within Ontario, I'll touch on Canada as well, and then I'm going to go into what the Canadian Food Inspection Agency does for surveillance, what our annual surveys look like, how we decide on where we're going to survey, the um, number of sites that we do, and then how we follow up on reports from the public. So with Victoria's invasion history, she already touched on a little bit of this. I'm specifically going to focus on the regulated areas within Canada. So we first had all of British Columbia become regulated back in the mid-1900s, early 1900s, um, as it was found throughout the entire province. Uh, as Victoria mentioned, it is native or at least controlled and not causing widespread damage throughout the province. Then in 2017, Hemlock Lily Belgian was discovered in the southwestern portion of Nova Scotia. And since that point, it has spread to seven other count to seven total counties within Nova Scotia. It's pretty darn widespread there. They do a lot of surveys in that area as well, and a lot of groups are working together to help in the management. Um, as Victoria mentioned, Nova Scotia is pretty far gone, and I don't have any images of it here, but the continuous landscape of hemlock there has like true large dead stands of hemlock trees. So their management tactics are a little different than ours. Our populations, we suspect, are a little younger, and we're at a point where hopefully with more work from CFS and engagement from the province and groups like yourselves, we can prevent large stands from completely dying. Now, in Ontario, we did have detections back in 2013 uh, in the Mississauga area. We did have detections in uh, the Niagara Glen as well. Those ones were eradicated. In that case, we had just single trees that were found to be infested. We were able to cut those down, complete five years of additional surveys within the area where we were not able to find any signs or symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid, so we declared them eradicated. However, in 2019, in the Niagara Glen, in the city of Niagara Falls, and then in Wayne Fleet, two more established populations were found that were on more than just one tree. Um, and so we, were a, we declared those locations regulated as just cutting down the trees wasn't going to cut it for eradicating. Then next year, the year after that, we discovered an infestation in the town of Fort Erie. And in that case as well, it was more than just a few trees. So that area was regulated. For more recent detections through our annual surveys, we found an infestation in Pelham, which is where we were yesterday, um, at a nature sanctuary that bordered on a few other properties. It um, was generally in fair health, the overall st health stand of the health was fair, but there were moderate to high levels of infestation, particularly at the heart of the infestation. Um, you were actually able to look up in the canopy and you could see the egg masses quite easily above you without needing any sort of binoculars or, you know, intense survey methods. Um, now, this location wasn't too surprising, especially considering how hemlock lily delgid tends to spread through the migratory bird route. Um, it's so close to the either two other three regulated areas. When we do our annual surveys, we really focus on areas nearby to where known infestations are. So we focus a lot of surveys within this general area of Ontario, and these locations weren't too shocking. 
What was shocking was a call that we got from our friends at Canadian Forest Services in July of 2022 regarding the Grafton location. They were there doing some other work and they identified signs and symptoms of hemlock woolly belgid. This is actually the picture that they had sent us. Um, and you can see, hopefully, all these white fluffy masses just along the twigs. Um, Friends at Canadian Forest Services, they're great at identifying hemlock woolly adelgid. Otherwise, the phenology work would be a little harder to do. So we sent our, um, our crew to the site right away to collect samples. We assessed the health of the stand as well. Overall, we agreed with everything that Canadian Forest Services said. It was heavily infested. We got our results back from our lab and we put a prohibition of movement on just the property that had the infestation. What's concerning now is that we are now at the north shore of Lake Ontario, and it's just at the base of much more of hemlock of the hemlocks within Ontario through more continuous hemlock stands as opposed to the patchy ones that we have in southern Ontario. So once this unfortunately gets moved a little further north where those properties are larger there's a lot of more um, like publicly owned land and um, provincial parks it's going to be harder to get many more crews in there where there are many lakes and the monitoring might be a little more difficult so this provided a scary and really unique opportunity to engage more action in hemlock woolly and Elgin monitoring and management. And then I also wanted to touch on the detection uh, in Hamilton that occurred just last month. This was reported to us by the Royal Botanical Gardens. They found a few trees as they were doing some um, trail maintenance. They sent it over to Canadian Food Inspection Agency right away. We sent our crews on site to collect samples and do a bit of a stand assessment. What was difficult, though, was that there was still snow on the ground. The terrain wasn't exactly even. It was icy. It was this awful mixture of rain and snow. So doing a full stand assessment was a little dangerous for our inspectors, but we were able to determine that it was moderately to heavily infested. The overall health of, its, of the stand was fair. But what's concerning is that this is a heavily trafficked area by hikers. It's quite nearby to McMaster University, which brings a lot of other individuals to the area. And Royal Botanical Gardens is a wonderful place for education and research. And so having a new infestation in this area is equally concerning. And unfortunately, if you're someone like me, kind of exciting because it's now, again, a, a popular area where hopefully more action and research can come from this space. So because this detection bordered on Royal Botanical Gardens property, City of Hamilton property, as well as some private residences, CFIA has a lot more follow-up to do. Um, we will be working with the City of Hamilton to connect with residents, do surveys on their properties, determine exactly how widespread the infestation is, use it as an education and outreach opportunity to explain how to reduce the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid and truly be able to, as best as we can, control and reduce the spread. Now, I did want to touch on how we respond to detections in spaces where it stands on um, residential properties, as well as some larger single wood lots where not many people are affected, um, because we will be asking you to engage in the monitoring network, whether through the community science project that Darissa and Victoria will be speaking about later, or by passing along any of your survey data through Survey123 or just emailing it to us. Um, so I wanted to ensure you understood what would happen if there was a positive detection on a property that you were looking at. So in the case of the Royal Botanical Gardens detection, we will always follow up on site. Preferably, we'd like to review images of the suspect signs beforehand to determine either the level of infestation or to determine if it's just one of the lookalikes and it might not warrant a field visit. In the case of many of the ones that we've had and I've just discussed, they did warrant field visits. The, the images were pretty clear that they were hemlock woolly belgid. So we send our inspectors on site. They will collect a sample. Anytime there's suspect signs, even if they come in from a reputable source like Canadian Forest Services, CFIA has to collect their own sample and submit it to our own lab for analysis. 
We will wait until we get the results back. We'll be working and speaking with the landowner throughout this entire process to answer any questions that they may have. And in the event of positive lab results, we immediately communicate that to the landowner or owners involved and we issue a prohibition of movement on the property. That just means that any articles or commodities that could harbor hemlock woolly adelgid cannot move from the property. Yes. Would that be just like strictly hemlock material or what if we have other like pine plantations? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm gonna have a slide going over that so it'll be written down, but regulated articles include propagative and non-propagative material of the hemlock genus. So that would be like live plants, as well as branches or wreaths, logs, lumber, anything with bark attached, as well as firewood of all species. We have a few images coming up that will show that the egg masses can actually adhere to the bark of any tree. And that's why we will not allow the, fire, the movement of firewood. That's applicable for any forest pest though. So much of Southern Ontario is regulated for um, emerald ash borer and spongy moth. So moving firewood, if you've seen any of our signs out and about is really frowned upon. Yes. Is there a plan to expand the uh, regulated area? That's also a great question, which I will also be getting to shortly, but I'll answer quickly right now. Um, we do plan on expanding the regulated area, but the size of which that we expand it to will depend on the results of our annual surveys this year. Um, when we decide to expand a regulated area, we like to do it at the smallest scale possible. So if I go back, you'll see that our regulated areas were really restricted to the city or township level. Now, if we think about a pest like emerald ash borer that truly spreads so quickly, we had to regulate almost all of Southern Ontario. Our goal is still to regulate at the smallest scale if possible. So, and now I'm just speaking about my hopes and dreams as opposed to what might actually happen. In the case of the city of Grafton find, we um, did complete 10 additional surveys around the positive location there. We worked with the city as well as county and forestry members to identify as many hemlock stands as possible, complete full surveys at those sites. And at that point, no signs and symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid were detected. We're continuing to follow up in this area as well as a little bit more outside. And my hope dream is that we only regulate at the city scale. Unfortunately, if signs and symptoms of hemlock woolly adelgid are found let's say in the Milton Oakville area or a little further north of the Grafton find, it might mean that we have to regulate at a larger scale, like all the counties around Lake Ontario or God forbid, most of Southern Ontario. So I'm getting a little off topic here. I'll finish up on how we respond to detections and then coming up, I will go into our surveillance plan and I'll speak a little bit more about our strategic site selection, where we'll be completing surveys and that will speak to how we're trying to keep the regulated areas as small as possible. I do also want to say that your help through your monitoring, reporting to CFIA where hemlock woolly adelgid is as well as is not, is very important. If ever we do have a suspect report, we'll follow up, but getting the knowledge of where hemlock woolly adelgid is not, as well as where additional hemlock stands are, will help guide our future work. So that was my little spiel. Uh, okay, so. Unfortunately, positive detection, we notify the landowner, prohibition of movement, we've spoken about some of the regulations already. And then in the case of the Royal Botanical Gardens, you can see these are all residential streets here. So we worked with the municipality, as well as um, the Royal Botanical Gardens, and through various media posts and some door-to-door -door activity, we started going to the residents to educate on hemlock woolly adelgid and check their backyards, their properties for presence of hemlock woolly adelgid or absence, as well as the trees in general, of like the hemlock trees, so that we can continue to either monitor or track which properties are at risk of eventually having hemlock woolly adelgid. Because the weather the past few weeks have been kind of weird, we've got 25, 30 degree weather this week, but a few weeks ago when we were doing our follow-up, there was snow and rain and wind and it wasn't exactly the safest conditions. Not only that, the snow and the ice on the branches make it a little difficult to positively identify hemlock woolly adelgid right away. We have a lot more follow-up to do. We're also incorporating a lot of sites 
in city of Hamilton and around city of Hamilton to again, inform regulatory decisions going forward. Then in the case of the Grafton Fund, like I've mentioned, we completed 10 additional surveys in the like 50 kilometer radius around the site. We'd also completed follow-up based on suspect reports because after the Grafton Fund, there was a webinar that the Invasive Species Center coordinated where we really tried to target individuals at the new at-risk area. Um, you know, I think in answering your question, I've touched on everything else from this slide. Um, essentially, when we have any positive detection, not only do we follow up at the site to get uh, to delimit the population, but we get as many hemlock stands around the known infestation as possible. Yes. Um, one of the things you mentioned on a previous slide was that uh, the areas where, where there's lots of hikers, how hikers spread it? Because I'm thinking of the Northumberland trails where people walk all the time so how does a, a hiker or a walker spread it so when hemlock trees their branches are overhanging on the trails or if a hiker goes off trail for any reason and they brush up on hemlock trees during the crawler or egg mass stage that those can actually adhere to their clothing their hair their backpack and if they don't follow proper biosecurity protocols when leaving the site and they perhaps go to another site that day or like they, they you know move it so then like a tick. exactly uh well actually i'll get i'll get into our biosecurity protocol later but i'll touch on it now one of the things that we do recommend is to wear light colored clothing when going in any forest. It's basic tick protection, but you can also easily identify the crawler stage because it's it's dark, it's black. Um, so I'm gonna hammer home biosecurity protocols in my presentation today. And then if you are going to the field site with us, we've actually brought all the equipment so that you can complete the full biosecurity um, protocol after leaving the site to reduce the spread. Um, what? Another way that humans can mediate the spread is through the movement of firewood. Um, unfortunately, because these insects are asexual, just a single crawler or an egg mass, they're so easy to miss on firewood. Um, if that's moved, then it could start a whole new population. Um, any other questions while I'm sort of forgetting where I'm supposed to go next? <laughs> Okay, so specifically for reports uh, from the public, there are a few various ways that we can get them in. The most popular is when individuals Google, what is this pest I found in my backyard? And somehow CFIA comes up. We have our own report a pest page. We are exploring additional ways to make it easier to report pests. We have a survey one, two, three form for hemlock woolly adelgid that I'll be really advertising later today. Um, but either way, when we get reports in from the public, we do encourage images, not only of the suspect signs and symptoms, but of the stand or the tree overall so that we can get an idea of the general health and what we're getting into if we send inspectors on site. So we get an image, it's indicative of hemlock woolly adelgid. We go on site. Not only are we collecting a sample, but we are assessing the health of the tree and the stand. We're looking for the signs that uh, Victoria had mentioned earlier, finished grayish green looking crown or any sort of discoloration of the tree. We're also trying to assess the potential size of the infestation to determine what our next steps will be for regulation. Is it likely that we'll just be placing a prohibition of movement or is it a street tree that can be cut down and then we'll look around the surrounding area to verify that it was just that individual tree. We'll also try to assess what the source of the introduction was as well as potential risk makers for spread. So source of introduction will help guide us in finding additional areas to survey. Unfortunately for this insect, it's very likely that all the sources of introduction thus far have been through the migratory bird pathway. But for some other insects uh, like spongy moth, we can assess whether it came in on nursery stock and then uh, do follow up to check all the other nurseries or locations where the nursery stock might have gone. Risk makers for spread is really important as well so that we can identify what groups we need to work with to do some proactive monitoring and also determine what areas are now at risk. Grafton find, for example, that was pretty general risk makers for spread. Again, the migratory bird pathway, but now there's so much more space for it to expand into. 
So we collect our samples, send it to the lab, receive it back. It's positive, unfortunately. Then we follow up with the regular process that I've mentioned in the previous two slides. Um, and we do use all of our reports from the public, whether they are confirmed positive or negative, but the general health of the stand was not good to inform site selection for the subsequent year's surveys. So every time that we work with the public, it does end up helping and guiding uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency activities. Regulated articles. There's my lovely list of non-propagative material that can harbor hemolocally delgid. I'm just going to briefly go over this. So any propagated or non-propagative material of the hemlock, the Suga genus, cannot be moved out of regulated areas. Regulated areas include those three townships I'd already discussed, as well as areas that have prohibition of movements on them, like the um, class camp property that we'll be going to today. Now, Victoria had mentioned that they collect samples. So if someone is doing research, they have to work with the CFIA to obtain permission for moving regulated articles off property. And in the case of an incredibly invasive species like this, there are quite a few hoops that you have to jump through. A lot of inspections by CFIA staff have to take place. So in the event that more of Southern Ontario becomes regulated for hemlock leodelgid, we will be working a lot more with the public, with foresters who are doing logging exercises in infested areas to help determine the best methods so that as much as possible, their activities can continue while also reducing the risk of spread. And then as I mentioned, firewood of all species can't move out of the regulated area. So our surveillance plan for 2023-2024, typically we have around 80 to 90 sites, but given the location in Grafton and how it opens up to a lot more high risk areas, um, we've increased our sites to 100 this year, as well as working with groups like the Invasive Species Center to develop a hemlock leodelgid monitoring network to get more people involved. Our, our Strategic site selection focuses on areas that are around the newest detection, as well as all nurseries importing hemlock stock, especially from those states that might be nearby to regulated areas or states that have counties with a few regulated areas. We also will target urban parks and green spaces with hemlocks. Um, to sort of account for the risk of hikers moving the material. And then hemlock forest stands along migratory bird routes. So here, this is the image of the um, known distribution of HWA within Eastern, Can Eastern North America as of this past year. I did, I had the uh, March detection in Hamilton myself, um, but you can see that there are so many areas that are at risk from spread of New York State. As well, we cover off a lot of areas in Sault Ste. Marie due to the risk of spread up from Michigan. So what I wanted to touch on here, I'm a walker apparently. Um, what I wanted to touch on here is how a lot of our previous surveys took place down in Southern Ontario because we really were concerned about the spread from the Canadian infestations as well as the United States. Every year we do cover off Sault Ste. Marie to ensure that it's still free from hemlock woolly adelgid. This coming year though, we're gonna try to fill up this space as much as possible. This map only has the sites that we targeted in 2022-23. I do have additional maps that show all of our historic sites and it paints a little bit of a nicer picture than this one, but even still north of Lake Ontario wasn't too heavily targeted. We do typically focus in this area, if we're gonna cover north of Lake Ontario, but this whole section here is kind of bare when it comes to survey results. And then we will continue to respond to suspect reports from the public, any reports from the community monitoring network that Invasive Species Center is coordinating as well. And all of this will help inform the regulatory decisions going forward. Timing-wise for any, any regulatory decisions, that's kind of out of my hand. I just collect the data and let some other more politically savvy people determine the, the regulated areas. Now, this is another one of my call outs to you. If you know of any hemlock stands around this area, north of this area, Peterborough area, 
please reach out to me and let me know. We are currently in the process of determining our sites for this year, and we have a lot of information for southwestern Ontario, but not as much for the area that we're in now in the newest at-risk area. So let me know. Um, that. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on our survey methodology here, but after the health break, we'll be going into various ways that you can monitor for hemlock woolly adelgid. So typically a lot of our surveys are visual, although if it's difficult to do just a visual survey using the naked eye or binoculars or hand lens, we will also employ some of the other methods that we'll be going over after the health break. We will assess a certain number of trees depending on the size of the stand. Typically, a lot of our stands are greater than three hectares, so we're surveying around or at least 100 trees. Um, if it's a three hectare stand, but there isn't a huge hemlock presence, we will survey 100% of the trees. What we will focus on is typically the outer one meter of two branches on a single tree, but while walking between trees, we will also scan the ground, look at all hemlock twigs that we find, as well as the boles of many trees. As I mentioned, the egg masses can really adhere to the bark quite easily. This is my biosecurity precautions page. So when you'd ask your question about how hikers can be a vector for spread, this is what I was referring to. Those are all egg masses that have blown off and got caught in my colleague's hair. Now, I do want to mention he is based out of British Columbia, and so the infestations are a little different there. But even yesterday, while we were in the field, Victoria was the lucky individual who had an egg mass get caught on her pants. So I'm going to really hammer this home right now. I'll really hammer it home later today. And then when we leave the site today, I will once again really hammer it home. Our biosecurity precautions. We are currently in the highest risk period for the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid through the eggs and crawlers. This spans from April until the end of September. Now, that being said, anytime you go into a known infested stand, please follow the biosecurity protocols. So when visiting a high risk suspect or known infested area, we request that you do not place any gear on or near hemlock trees. That means don't take off your sweater, hang it on a nearby branch. Don't take off your backpack, lean against the bowl of the tree. Don't rub up on a tree like a bear. Basically try to keep your distance, be aware of where the overhanging branches are. Many of them can be low, your hat can brush up against it and you could end up like my colleague here. That being said, a lot of this might happen inadvertently, so when you leave the site, wipe down all equipment with an ethanol-based cleaner. Your equipment can include basically anything that a lint roller just won't do the trick for, so that's like hard hats, um, your water bottles, you can wipe that down with an ethanol-based cleaner. Um, uh, I will be wearing my rubber boots today, I'm going to really scrub those off, and then they'll also get a nice spray down with an ethanol-based cleaner. Lint rolling is pretty darn effective for getting the egg masses and crawlers as well. I think we have, what, 30 lint rollers on us today. You're going to get everything, including your hair. I promise lint rolling your hair is not as uncomfortable as it sounds. But we will also request that you launder all your clothing prior to going to another infested site. If that's a little ridiculous, at least throw it in the dryer on a heat cycle, as that heat will not be good for the crawlers or egg masses either. CFIA in particular, we get pretty intense. If we are in a known infested area, we will fully launder all our clothing, we will shower, and we will also detail our car before going to another area. Now that's also because we complete export and import activities with nurseries and whatnot, and having CFIA be a vector of spread would look really bad on our mandate, but we really do take all necessary precautions. Today, we have all the materials that you'll need to follow the biosecurity protocol. And that's all for me right now, unless we have any questions, I think we're good to take the health break. Yeah. Okay, so um, Nicole and I are going to tag team this next section of presentation. Um, we're going to go over some of the different ways that you can survey for hemlock woolly adelgid. So we'll go over, this is not in like perfect order, but in, we'll go over visual surveys and tools available. So survey one, two, three, CFIA survey protocol. Um, some tools um, that you can use when surveying visually, like a high power flashlight, um, bark examination, then we'll go over fall sampling, uh, 
and including like the equipment, how you make the balls for ball sampling and the methods and protocol and how you can select how many balls are gonna shoot through the tree, uh, how many trees to sample on your lot and then interception traps. So that will be our sticky traps and the Vaseline and eDNA traps, yes. Do you know where that picture was taken? Yes, that is in Wayne Tree. So we pass one. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go over the visual survey aspect. We're going to start with just the canopy examination. This is primarily what CFIA uses for our visual surveys, although we do also implement some of the other ones that we'll be going over today, um, especially if we have suspect, but we can't quite verify that's when we'll implement something like ball sampling or pole pruning to truly get a sample. So when visually surveying for hemlock lily adelgid, the goal is to examine at least two branch tips per tree. We focus on the outer one meter of the branch tip, the newest growth, and we scan the underside of the hemlock twig as the ovisacs are always on the underside. For the ovisacs, if necessary, if the canopy is quite high up, there are no low hanging branches, we'll use binoculars as well. We scan each branch tip for about a minute, then go to the opposite side, scan another branch tip. And we aim to do around 100 trees because a lot of our sites are greater than three hectares. Now, if you have a smaller wood lot or if you have more time than CFIA staff do, we do recommend surveying as many trees as possible. We keep about 25 paces between our trees when surveying. And typically we will choose a random direction to go in next to ensure that we're getting a full distribution of the stand when completing our surveys. Um, when it's a large hemlock dense area, we also use um, a map of the space beforehand to break it up into quadrants. And in each quadrant, we'll survey, let's say it's a four quadrant property, we'll survey about 25 trees per quadrant, and we'll map it out beforehand to ensure that we're covering off pretty even points throughout the stand, so that we can confidently say that, you know, this quadrant of the stand is free from Tumwapoli Adelgid. This method is easy. It's pretty darn free unless you need a pair of binoculars. Um, but you are limited based on how much you can see with your own eye as well. If it's an initial infestation, you might really only see one or two egg masses per branch. It might not even be on every branch. So there is the possibility to miss really low level infestations or high crown infestations. Um, do you want to go over the flashlight part? Sure. <laughs> So one of the tools that you can use besides binoculars when you're doing visual surveys is a um, high powered flashlight. Um, this one specifically is recommended by um, Dr. Mark Whitmore, who is from Cornell University and does a lot of research on um, hemophily adelgid. So he and his crew have this in their toolkit when they are finding uh, or looking for hemophily adelgid. And essentially it is a high powered, like high lumen um, headlamp that you can focus the beam into the canopy. So essentially what you would do is you would be out looking, look up into the canopy on a day that is not wet, perfect, preferably. Um, so no dew, no recent rain, not currently raining. Um, and I think it works a little bit better on an overcast day, something that's not super sunny. But um, you can look up into the canopy. It's a 2000 lumen, this one specifically, 2000 lumen headlamp. And you can adjust that beam right up into the canopy. And those ovisacs will sort of reflect or fluoresce a little bit, which makes it a little bit easier to see. You could use it with your binoculars at the same time. Um, or you can be one person has the headlamp, another person has binoculars and looking. Um, it's just a little bit easier to see higher up in the canopy um, than just using binoculars alone. So something to keep in mind, it's relatively inexpensive in the long run because you can use it for a long time. I think it's about 
I think I found this one on Amazon and it was about $100 at the time. If anybody does want to add this to their toolkit and they want to know um, where to find it, there is, so it is written right here. It's the 2000 Lumen Coast XPH34R, but I can also get the link and email it to you. Um, just come and find me after we can connect um, outside of this and I can send it to you. Um, so a lot of the survey methods that we'll be going over today, we will mention that they can be used in conjunction with another, with one another. So if you're doing visual surveys and you're out with a crew or a few people, that's a great time. If you can't afford it, use the high powered flashlight, use binoculars. You can use a pull printer to get branch tips from up in the canopy, that kind of thing. I do recommend, regardless of whatever method that you're using, you are scanning the bark and the bowl of trees nearby as you're walking around. Um, for some reason, I can't remember if we have this slide, but also scanning the ground for any hemlock twigs and picking those up and inspecting them for hemlock lily delgid. For examining the bark of trees, we do recommend that you focus on the lower 1.5 to 2 meters of the trunk. This is a great image here of an egg mass caught in some bark. I do want to note, don't have to be specific to hemlock trees for this survey. Um, inspect any rough bark tree because hemlock egg masses are not particular when they're being blown in the wind, they'll catch on anything. We recommend that you survey the bark for about one to two minutes as there can be a lot of things that look like the uh, hemlock lily delgid egg masses. Um, some sap that's dripped off, some bird poop. There are also other like insects and pathogens that can result in little white patches on the bark. Um, but if you see something like this, this could be indicative of an infestation nearby. So let's say you see that on a tree, you think it's hemlock lily delgid, that's a point where employing some of the other methods, whether it's the visual surveys, the ball sampling, what have you, um, to go verify presence or absence on actual twigs. And, and that's actually what we do mention here. Um, use it in conjunction with ball sampling to detect low to moderate infestations. So we do recommend, as with the visual surveys of canopy, keep about 25 paces between the trees that you're surveying. Um, but if you're on a nice leisurely walk, why not just take a look at the bark as you're walking through to see if you can find any hemophilia delgid egg masses. Okay, so as I said yesterday, the fun part, the ball <laughs> sampling. <laughs> yes. Good question here. Could say um, you're in an area where there's other similar kinds of pests, because this thing isn't the only thing that's white and wool. <laughs> there, there's similar ones on maple, alder, beech, offhand. And if you know which is which, outside of just seeing it sitting on a hemlock tree. So ultimately, if you are finding it through visual surveys where you're looking at the bark of a tree or on the forest floor, um, that could be a good time to then specifically look at the hemlock trees and see if you're finding it there. And if you can't find it, but you're still concerned that that's what it came from, that would be when you could call CFIA and they can come out and do a full scale inspection for you. Um, anything that is suspected, even if it ends up not being um, hemlock lily diligent, you should call them because they can come and take a look and confirm or deny. <laughs> And I hadn't told this anecdote earlier, but like if it's white woolly on a hemlock tree, we'll come out. This past October, we had a pest call out actually nearby the disc area, and it turned out it was the fake spider webbing that people put on their tree from the like, houses. <laughs> so we will entertain any suspect report because we do not want to have missed it and found later an infestation. So there are some other things on hemlock trees that present some similar signs, but going into the field today, you'll really see what the egg masses look like on the twigs. So if you think you suspect it on some bark, that's the opportunity to go and start looking at the nearest hemlock tree, look at the twigs in the visual survey method that we've recommended and call. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, I miss this for a minute. I'm first just going to go over kind of what the ball sampling is and how you 
can get your own equipment to do it, how you can make your own equipment to do it. Um, it is a fairly fun method to go out and do. If you have ever done any sort of archery in the past, or if you've done slingshotting with like marbles or rocks or something, it's fairly similar. Um, the main piece of equipment that we recommend because it's very easy for anybody to get is the Hyper Pet tennis ball launcher that is a dog toy. It is meant for launching tennis balls for your dog to chase. Um, so you can buy this specifically from Cabela's. Um, Chewy, I believe. It's very easy to get. You can buy replacement slings, which I definitely recommend if you're going to buy this equipment, buy a lot of replacement slings. You will have one that will last you four weeks and you will have three that break the first time you pull them. <laughs> it's just unfortunately the way that this tool works. Um, very easy to use um, in your non-dominant hand. Hold on to it, there's a brace on your arm. Let that push in when you are launching it is also my recommendation because if you are trying to put it all on your wrist to hold it steady, your wrist will be very sore and you will most likely hit the launcher with the slingshot itself. I will pass this around as well. Yeah, and I will do a demonstration of the ball sampling when we're in the field as well for anybody that's interested. <laughs> Not <laughs> so um, you're not using tennis balls. Those you can just take off and, I don't know, put them on your chairs or let your dog play with them. You are going to use racket balls for this. So any racket ball will work, any color. Pink is easy to see. Um, I use blue and red um, because they come in the ball packs. So. You're going to take the ball and you're going to cut this one. You're going to cut a hole into it like this. Make it pattern. Make it pattern. <laughs> and then stuff it as full as you can without deforming the ball with different sizes of like wooden beads. And then super glue it back together into a ball. The so beads just help add weight and reduce the bounce of the ball itself. Then um, you can get any type of Velcro. Um, you can get some that are adhesive, some that aren't, whatever's going to work. Ultimately, I would use super glue to reinforce it regardless. And you're going to cut it into smaller strips and wrap it around the ball in a um, basketball like, seam sort of pattern around the ball. So it's, you're also using the hook side of the Velcro, not the soft side, or it won't work. <laughs> and this one has fake HWA Ovisac on it, and I will pass this kit around for you to take a look at as well. <laughs> um, those are all the materials you would need. Um, and then when you are actually out in the field using this method, we recommend that you have proper protective equipment, so a hard hat, safety glasses, um, high vis vest is always recommended when you're working in the field. Um, and then you will need a stick toothbrush. Um, you'll use that to clean off the velcro in between. You'll pick up like, other debris as it's rolling on the ground. Um, or if you are trying to do a delimitation survey, you might be cleaning it off so that you can see, okay, I've got a hole on this tree, but I want to make sure it's cleaned off the next tree. Um, so it's pretty simple like kit that you need overall, um, and then you just have to design what your actual protocol is going to be. Oh, and gloves. I can see them later on, but the nylon like dips sort of like work slash gardening gloves work really well. Dark colors um, of that work really well because you will eventually wear through um, the fingertips of the gloves of the nylon or the, the dip part. And if it's a light colored material, sometimes you'll get like enough, they're white gloves, for example, material that falls up, gets stuck to it, and then you could end up thinking you have a positive when you don't. It is pretty easy to tell the difference, but just in case, that is what we recommend. Okay, so.
So ball sampling methods, uh, we recommend that you focus on the 50 meter edge of a stand. If it, if you want to, you could do it in the direction of the closest infestation or the direction um, that birds might be migrating through your area. Um, they're most likely to land in that sort of outer section and have about 80-ish percent of those trees that you're sampling be in that be in that 50 meter edge and then some internal trees along the way. Uh, again, it will be 25 paces apart in a half hazard direction. Um, and each shot with the ball should contact at least two branch tips. Aim high in the crown, if possible, you would be looking for an early detection that's most likely going to start in the upper third of the crown where a bird's landing, and that's why you're not seeing it visually as well. And for survey timing, spring is optimal. That is when the wool is the fluffiest and most abundant because you are getting into multiple generations there. Um, the wool that is developed through the winter months tends to be more tightly packed because it's actually protecting the insect from the cold temperatures. Whereas in the spring, they grow so quickly, they don't need that protection. That wool is fluffier itself, which is why most of the time we're recommending in the spring. If you can't get out of the spring, I did do some research on this recently and I didn't put a, any of like the data up here, but the spring was like the best time of year. The summer was also pretty good. You have a pretty good chance of detecting it. Once you hit the fall time, it drops off fairly significantly. Um, winter, not super recommended. Um, snow can then cover your balls as it rolls, especially if it's packing snow. I did encounter that recently <laughs> where um, you won't actually see anything and you'll be in cleaning the snow off of your racquetballs. You'll probably also pull any evidence of the wool off as well. If it is wet, it will still stick. It's just the wool itself will look slightly duller. Yes. Uh, the summer timing would that apply also to like visual observation? Yes. Yeah. You can so you can see it any time of year. So like even now we're a bit early. We're not getting those like super fluffy ovisacs on the branches when we go out to the field. You'll see that if you decide to join us. Um, but yeah, you can still see remnant. Um, Obisacs. It's just they dry out a bit, they're a little duller, they do fall, so they'll, um, it's just not as apparent. So the best time is in the spring when you're going to have the most wool and it's going to be the fluffiest and the brightest. And you'll again have a couple of different generations of Obisacs on the branch still. Yeah. So limitations to this um, terrain and steep slopes. You don't really want to be chasing balls down the side of the hill if you can avoid it. Um, and it's very labor intensive. The other thing is if your trees are like along a ravine and like mostly like along the water's edge, um, again, the ball might land in the water and you can still see the wool, but depending on like how close to the water's edge it is, you might just lose balls in the middle of the river or whatever. Um, and you will probably, I recommend a lot of balls. Make a lot of balls if you're going to do this because you will lose some, trees hit them. <laughs> and like, they might just, they go up and they don't come down until a windstorm comes. <laughs> then you'll go back later on and find them. But um, between that and some that just end up like in a marsh or something that you can't get to or so buried in mud that you don't see it or go under some foliage and despite all your best efforts of looking for it and you saw it when it landed, it's no longer there when you're standing over top of it, which happens quite frequently, so. <laughs> so these are just a little bit of food for thought um, for when you're designing um, a protocol for using ball sampling. I'm just gonna make sure that we're getting all the data here straight, so. We've done some work internally to look at essentially how many balls through each tree you would need to shoot and how many trees you would need to sample to increase your probability, but also making the best decision of like weighing the volume of work with the probability of detection. 
So in the first table here, it's the recommended number of ball samples to detect a small infestation of HWA in an individual tree for a range of detection probabilities. The probabilities will be higher than listed if the incidence of HWA in the tree exceeds the level of a small infestation that is defined as one, defined as one where approximately 2% or more of the twigs have HWA or 2% or more of the hemlock trees in a stand are infested with HWA. So you'll see five balls, 35%, 30 balls, 80%. I would say my recommendation is somewhere around 20 to 25, depending if you have the ability to do that, because then you get into at least the 70 to 75 range. And if you can do a few more trees, then you'll still get some good results. Um, 30 trees is, or 30 balls through the tree is pretty excessive. When I've done this in the past with my research, like I was sampling 25 trees for the purposes of looking at detectability through the field season with um, 20 balls through each tree. And that's, if you could do the fast math, that's like 500 shots at a minimum. And then you think about the balls you lose, the times you shoot and it doesn't actually go anywhere. Um, so it's pretty exhausting. And when I was doing all the shots by myself, I was bruised on my arm, my wrists hurt. So it's good to have a crew that you can share the work with and it makes it so much easier. So the number of trees to sample to detect, detect a small HWA infestation in a hemlock stand for a range of detection probabilities for a stand level survey is to take 10 samples per tree um, and the method assumes a stocking of 2000 hemlock trees in a four hectare hemlock stand. So I feel like a lot of people probably don't have that density of hemlock. So take that with a grain of salt <laughs> and then adjust it for your use. 75% chance of a probability of detecting an HWA infestation with 130 trees, 95% with 270. And that's 10 samples per tree. So if you up that, you could do fewer trees. Um, and so again, combining these, these are all available. These are public access documents. So you can take a look at this study if you want. The other thing that I didn't put up here, but I probably should have, is that we have done um, some research into combining different types of surveys. So when we recommend using the bark sampling with the ball sampling, that one gives you the highest probability of detection um, and actually reduces the amount of time to about like 11 minutes to the first detection in a low to moderate infestation. Um, and I think actually brings it up to like 100% probability of detection with the math that they did, the crazy stats. So... <laughs> Um, and I should also mention here, and I forgot to mention it yesterday to the other group, but the ISC does have a video that goes over um, how to create the balls, how to go out and properly use the equipment. And I'll do that all again when we're in the field, um, not making the balls, but how to actually use the equipment in the field. Um, but it's a really good video that goes over everything. Are there any questions about ball sampling before I move on? Interception traps. So interception, interception traps are any trap that is passively out and intercepting the insect. So you, some people here might be familiar with the green prison traps that were used for emerald ash borer. That is a similar concept to what this is, but there's no lure involved. So the CD traps, I did bring some with me so I can pass them around. These have HWA on it. It's long dead. These are from 2016 and have been in the freezer. So <laughs> um, on here, you will see that the sticky drop itself on the outside of the bag, that there's a grid drawn, and then a microscope is used to examine each area, and then somebody has circled, so there's little circles around all of the crawlers that they found, but it's a good way to show you just how small they are. Um, if you were thinking about employing this as one of your um, survey methods, you do need a microscope to properly examine them. And it's still can be difficult. And it, I can talk about some limitations, but there are, it is a good, good way of surveying. It's cheap, it's, um, you cover a wide area, but it does require some staff time and knowledge and you will need a microscope. Just a dissection scope is fine, but a microscope. 
Okay, so do the sticky traps. You're going to install a recommended two traps per site um, and attach them to wooden stakes under a hemlock, a minimum of 30 meters apart. So that trap itself will sit on the stake flat underneath the crown of the hemlock tree and it's just catching crawlers and wool and um, potentially winged adults as they fly off as it falls through the canopy. The, trunk, the cars are about 20 by 20 centimeters and we recommend installing them like mid-April to mid-July and then you should be able to intercept two crawler stages and potentially that winged adults stage. When you collect them, um, I think we recommend leaving them out a maximum of two weeks at a time because they do catch a lot of bycatch. Um, but when you collect them, put them in a freezer bag like you'll see, um, making sure that if there's like that white block to write on, that that's on the back side and not blocking your view because you will look through the microscope through the bag. You don't want to have to peel that off once it's been in the bag. Store them in the freezer until you're ready to look. Because it, any HIV way that could be caught is not going anywhere, it's not high risk of spreading anything at that point, and you don't need permitting for this type of um, trap. You just everything instead once it's in, in there. <laughs> so you'll inspect for crawlers and wool, and like I said, the winged adelgid, and you'll use a dissection scope. And it, with an, an experienced inspector, it takes approximately 20 minutes per trap. So that's somebody who's been doing this for a while, so do keep that in mind as well. The limitations to this, bycatch is a big one. Um, we do want to let you know that by using these city traps, you are at risk of catching other wildlife, um, birds, reptiles. Mm -hmm. So do keep that in mind. It is, like CFI uses them, a lot of other groups use them, and it's extremely rare that that happens. Um, some might say borderline unheard of, but it is a risk that it could happen. So keep that in mind. Um, and it's hard to identify the crawlers, could be under the bycatch, if you end up with a giant maple leaf that lands on there, you aren't looking at that entire quarter plus of the trap at that point. Um, and then the timing. We're still doing our phenology research, so that timing is pretty long that we're recommending. Once we have a better idea of that, we might be able to recommend a shorter time that you could put these traps out. And the ISC also has a video about making the sticky traps and installing them. So the other exception trap is the HWA monitoring network trap as well, but I'm going to first speak to it before we get into the HWA monitoring network about using it as just an interception trap because it might be a better option for your group than the sticky traps. So these were developed out of Grand Valley State University. Um, and so it's Dr. Charlene Partridge, her laboratory. Um, she is a geneticist, essentially. So that's partially how they developed this. And they're doing some ongoing research currently that I will get into. But essentially, it's a 3D printed trap. These are some of the first and second iterations of them. Um, and they just hold microscope slides. They're fairly inexpensive to print compared to some of the other options. They just hold the microscope slides, four of them. Here, 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 and here. They sit under the canopy just like the CD trap does. <laughs> but the slides themselves are dipped in Vaseline, a very thin layer of Vaseline. It covers about 50% of the slide. Um, only on one side, and it doesn't catch nearly as much bycatch as those. <clears throat> this is a great photo up here. This is covered in HWA crawlers, and when you get the slide, it just looks like somebody has taken a pepper shaker and sort of shaken that over top of it. So that can be a first sign, but when you look under a microscope, it is very clear that you are seeing insect once you're looking under a microscope. Much easier to do than the pre sticky traps because you're not looking through a bag and um, there's not all that other spy catch that is distracting you as you're looking through. Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy to ID and then beyond that it can be used for eDNA 
extraction. It's much easier to extract DNA from Vaseline than it is from the sticky trap material. Uh, surveying the spring with crawlers and winged adelgid are present, so it's the same timing that we would recommend at this point. And we are using them for the HOA monitoring network. Now, the ongoing research that is happening in Michigan, they are hoping to eventually be able to use these to quantify the level of infestation based on how much genetic, genetic material they are picking up. They are also working on how long they can leave the slides out for at one time without the UV rays um, degrading the DNA. So they're going to go plant DNA on the slides, take them out wrapped in um, cellophane, essentially, and then see how long it can stay out and still pick up DNA, as well as um, <clears throat> faster Vaseline DNA extraction methods, because currently you scrape all the Vaseline off, put it in a tube, then the Vaseline and the genetic material have to be separated before you can go on to the next steps of the PCR um, preparation. <laughs> so she is currently looking at anything like those cheek swabs, which will make our process faster and will make it so that we can offer more traps in the future, potentially. Um, and yeah, it's just a really interesting process. And obviously the downside to these, if you were hoping to use them for DNA and weren't a part of the initial network and aren't a part of it in the future or want to do a larger scale, is that they're expensive. <laughs> the traps themselves, very cheap. The DNA part, very expensive. Um, but that's why we're offering the monitoring network because it is also very effective. One of these tracks can pick up genetic material from up to, from an invested tree up to 300 meters away. So that's pretty impressive. Um, in the future, we'd love to be able to, like, people with larger woodlots, more hemlock trees, um, more than like a 300 meter radius, which most of you probably have. We're hoping to be able to offer more than one track to get better coverage of your stands in the future. But for this pilot project, this is what we're doing. And I think with that, we will, oh, survey one, two, three, then we will come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's <laughs> um, so I'm briefly going to touch on survey one, two, three, as it's a method that you can use in conjunction with the community science monitoring project that uh, Darissa and Victoria will go over in a moment, as well as separately, if you weren't able to sign up for the community science monitoring project. Um, so if you have a smartphone on you and you want to give it a try right now, you can scan that QR code. This form can be accessed on the app, the Survey123 app, which I have right here, or um, through a web browser. So you can use it on your smartphone or on a desktop. Um, this is completely free to use. No account is necessary, and it's a really quick and simple form. I'm going to let a few of you try to pick it up, and then I'm actually going to demonstrate how to use it through the desktop version. Um, I do want to note that it will be using GPS data to be able to get the location where you're completing the survey. So there is a privacy notice statement. It is long, and I will not be reading it out to you today, but you can read it at your leisure later. So, I'm going to wait for, um, also, if you wanted to try it when we actually go in the field, I have a copy of the QR code on my phone, so you can always scan that when we're out in the field together later. Oh, or yeah, Darissa can pass around a, a copy of the QR code right now if you want to try that. So how to use it, really simple. First, you scan the QR code, select the link. This is what will come up when you first scan it. If you already have the Survey123 field app, I highly recommend using that on your smartphone. This is what the form looks like. I'll show you all of it in just a moment. But um, you can also open it in your browser. There just are some like GPS issues. It doesn't necessarily have the quickest um, like linking for GPS. So let me get the form up. Is that one? Yes. Okay. Nope. Oh, there it is. 
Nice. Okay, so I'm going to be kneeling down right here um, so that I can go through the form with you, but it's pretty darn simple once I find where my mouse is. So what's really cool about this form, especially if you're accessing it from your phone while you're in the field, is that all the images that you'll see, you can actually click on those to enlarge them and they'll be able to help you with your identification of Hemlock Woolly Belgian. The first little bit of information just lets us, as the people who will be reviewing these forms, know who to contact if there are suspect signs identified. The date is also important as that can help us determine if perhaps the really beautiful white woolly egg mass that you got a picture of might not be hemlock woolly belgid given the time of year. It will automatically set to, to today's date, but you can click on this and backdate as necessary. Let's say if you just found out about this form today, but you know that you looked at a few trees over the weekend and want to include that. Then some of the information that we ask you to put in about yourself, I do want to note this section is mandatory every single question because we need to know who to contact if you do say that signs and symptoms are evident. So we require province because the entire province of British Columbia is regulated. So if you say you found signs and symptoms there, CFAA doesn't really take action. But if you say Ontario, that's more high risk and will follow up. We asked for the survey group as well, and you can see a few of the options here include community scientists, if you work with a conservation group or a non-government organization, municipal or regional, provincial, federal, uh, um, and that's so that we can get an idea of your scope of knowledge prior to coming on site. So this form has been made publicly available. We've brought it to the attention of many different groups, not just a group like yourselves. So there are many members of the public who might not have training on hemlock woolly adelgid identification. And that question just sort of helps us determine uh, how much training the individual may or may not have and whether they're fully aware of the risks of this species. Then of course, we ask for your name and email address. That's how we will contact you if you identify signs and symptoms. This is the privacy notice statement I had spoken about. Like I said, not gonna go through it right now because it's got a decent amount of information there and it does provide access to where you can ask more questions if you do have questions about that. As I mentioned, using the web browser, the GPS survey location doesn't come through quite as nicely or ever sometimes, but you can go ahead and just search the address of where you were, or if you know the GPS coordinates, you can type that in as well. It'll pull you to the place that it believes you're talking about, and then you can also zoom in, you can move the map, and you can select where you are. And then it'll pull up the Latin long as well as the actual Mir street address. You can't enter any information in here. That's the information that gets sent from the GPS coordinates. And we really don't ask for much information about your survey. We recommend around 100 trees to visually survey, but if you are only able to look at one or two, or if you have a small like residential property and you only have one or two hemlock trees on it, but you want to include your data, that's totally fine. And then we ask for your results. Only two options. If you select no signs or symptoms are observed, wonderful, really, really happy about that. And you can also include images. If you're using this on your phone, you can use your actual camera. Um, I'm not gonna choose that option because I don't want my face to flash up on the screen, but you can also drag and drop images or include images saved to your phone as well. Um, if no signs or symptoms are evident, we do still recommend that you include images of the general health of the stand uh, so that we can assess if perhaps that's a site we might want to follow up on if it's not looking too healthy. Now, if you select that signs and symptoms are present, we'll get a little bit more information come up. There's still the images. If signs and symptoms are present, please, please, please include images of those so it's easier for us to review. But what's cool is you can indicate the signs that you saw. So nymphs, if you want to get a better 
image of what that looks like. Um, if you're using the desktop browser, it'll show you a handful of similar images. Um, if you're using it on your phone, it'll actually make the image full screen when you click on it. So that'll help with identification. We have images of nymphs, as well as a really great image of the egg mass. Then we do ask that you provide a little bit more information on the span. So generally how infested was the one, one or multiple trees that you looked at and found signs and symptoms? What was the distribution? Was it uniform throughout your one hemlock grove or was it patchy? And then go into the level of defoliation and the level of dieback. That whole section only comes up if you select signs and symptoms are present. This section here I personally love because it helps CFIA determine the area that you are able to complete your survey at. So I'm not sure how functional it is on the browser version, but what you can do when you zoom in to a certain woodlot is map out the area that you were able to complete your survey at, sorry. By drawing a polygon around the area. So let's say you have a few acres and you're really only able to survey one small section of that and you want to communicate that information to CFIA, that's a great way to be able to do that. You can actually draw a polygon over where you were able to survey. And then finally, the last section um, is an additional notes area. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, are duplicates okay? Yeah. Let's say you survey the same area more than once, yeah. like a month later. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I So, I mean, a personal story here, I have a, a cottage property up north uh, with a lot of hemlock on there, and every time I go, I, I do survey it, and I, I add that information every time, so it's totally okay. It actually just demonstrates that you're, like, more thoroughly checking, and it's more likely that you'd be able to detect a, a low-level infestation if you go back on a regular basis and perhaps even inspect different trees than Maybe you had before. Are just as useful as positive ones. Yeah, exactly. It's actually just going to get into that, so negative results are just as useful as positive ones, not only because it demonstrates where hemlock woolly adelgid is not, but it helps CFIA identify additional hemlock stands that we might not have been able to target before. So that's why this additional notes section can come in handy. I personally have used it to record notes like wasn't able to survey all trees, still a lot available, would be great for an official survey site. Or if you're part of the community science monitoring network, this is where you can mention, I also have a um, sticky, uh, uh, an eDNA slide trap at the site, or I use the ball sampling method for this. So there's a lot of various ways that this form can be used. The last thing I'll mention about it is that it um, will automatically send myself as well as the other colleagues that work in a similar role for the CFIA across Canada an email if you select signs and symptoms are present, and we will follow up basically as soon as we get that email, especially if it's within Ontario or Nova Scotia, where we know infestations are presently spreading. Do we have any questions about the use of the form? Yes. Kind of related, but uh, data sharing, if we wanted copies of like the data for our property, is that available? So you'll have to reach out to us directly. Um, if it's for your property, then it would be easier to get. But if you wanted the information for like your county or something, there are memorandums of understanding that we have to go through. Um, we, we can jump through those hoops once, once we get all the permissions and you just have to reach out to myself directly for that. Uh, another thing I wanna bring up, this information will go on to CFIA's web maps where we can have all of our historical survey data. Um, if you are a municipal forester or you work for a conservation area and you already have some data log for tracking and you don't want to go ahead and enter a whole bunch of backdated survey forms, you can share your data with us. We can add that to our web map and that will again help us inform uh, for survey site selection or any regulatory decisions that might be necessary. So data sharing, whether it's us giving to you or your, you giving to us is always welcomed. You can also see your previous entries as well, like yourself. Yes. Um, yeah. 
yeah, um, once we're a little more one-on-one -on -one than this, I can actually show you what the app looks like on your phone. Um, I can show you part of it right now with some pictures that I've kept. So demonstration, we've done that. Um, if you're using the app and you've already done it once, clicking on it on your phone again, this is the first screen that'll come up. I mentioned this is completely free and no account is needed. So they actually hide that option down at the bottom here. Continue without signing in. You're going to select that. This is your home page, and that's the title of the form. You select that. Next page that comes up will give you the option to collect, which will allow you to submit additional data. And under that, it will say outbox. And there you can go through every form that you've submitted. If you'd like to edit at that point, you can do that as well. So you can go back and look at the other form you submitted, change any information that you might have gotten wrong. And that's me. So you guys can go over the monitoring network now. And uh, for 3123, I would add, you know, since my role is community science, that it's also a good tool if you are managing either county or municipality or somewhere where like public is using your trails. It's also a good opportunity to engage with them and ask them to use the form. So it's a completely publicly accessible form. And you know, you can use that as an outreach tool to just get other eyes on the ground for you too. Okay. So you've heard us talk about the Hemlockley Dungeon Monitoring Network, and some of you are here because you're receiving a eDNA kit from us. Um, those of you who are, who are not, you know, this year was a pilot project. We only had 50 kits available um, until we, you know, figure out some bugs, see how it works, um, and then hopefully in the future we'll be able to expand that. And like Victoria mentioned, you know, wood lotters can have multiple kits to fully assess the entire wood lot, um, and also more participants um, can participate. Um, and this is a joint project between the ISC, uh, CFS, and CFA. So it's a very collaborative effort um, that was able to bring this all together. So if you are receiving a kit, it's going to come in one of these envelopes. Um, and in the kit, you're going to have, firstly, the protocol that kind of goes over a little bit of background information, um, how to set it up, um, what's in your kit, it also has the survey one, two, three information in it as well, so that you can do a visual assessment while you're out there anyways. Um, how to set up the trap, how to take it down, trap storage, and like how to return it to us as well. Um, so all sorts of good information in there. In your kit, you are going to receive your trap. Um, like Victoria mentioned, there's kind of like a, a top and a base. Those are attached, you can open them, but they're attached just by a little ball chain and then a tag. So each one is numbered um, and you're assigned a specific track number for your woodlot. Um, in that bag, you're also gonna have a little wing nut and a bolt um, and that's just to, it's in the corner. You're looking for the stand? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to see it now. <laughs> um, the wing nut and the bolt, is to affix it to some sort of stand. We have these with us today. Um, so you can use a piece of corrugated plastic underneath and then the trap on top. And then that just helps it like lay flat, you poke the bolt through, screw the wing nut on, and you're good to go. Um, we also provided a little sign so that, especially if it is being put in. Uh, a woodlot that is publicly accessible. Um, this kind of just describes what it is, why it's there, who it's like responsible for it kind of thing. Um, and then like there's a little QR code to go to a community science website on the ISC website. So if, you know, if folks are interested when they see it, they can head there and figure out how they can also get involved. Um, there's also a little paint stick in your kit so that you can just like shove it into the ground if you want and like, attach it that way, kind of simple or catch it way you like. Um, you're also gonna receive these welcome tubes. These contain the microscope slides that go into the kit. Um, and so there's two slides in each falcon tube. They're kind of pressed together and then they were dipped in the petroleum jelly. So the outside is sticky, the inside is not. Um, 
but I can pass these around just to let you kind of see what they look like. Uh, here I have two sets of, yeah. So when you're putting them in the actual form, the sticky side. Sticky side up. So, and the sticky side on the outside. Or the so because there's two slides together. Right. This, I want to know what So then when you pull them out, you'll separate them. And the sticky, the sticky side. side's going to lay upwards, and the, the non-sticky side will be facing down in the slump, the trap. Oh, yeah, in the trap. Okay. The side that will be up is marked. Yeah. Yes. And that's where you'll put your pans and swap out the party and stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's two sets of gloves. Um, one for when you're setting it up so that there's no DNA contamination. Um, and one set for when you're taking it out of the uh, wood lot as well. So again, for just limited DNA contamination. Um, and then when you're getting ready to take it out of the bush, um, the trap itself, um, you actually can keep as long as you are willing to continue this study with us um, year after year. Um, if you aren't, if uh, you know unknown circumstances come up or something happens, you, and you just choose not to participate, um, just send me an email. My information is in the the uh, protocol. Um, you know, it was on the workshop document. All of those things you can find me pretty easily, um, and we'll you know send you a shipping label to send everything back. However, if you are participating your tier, you keep this, and there's a protocol in there on how to decontaminate it throw it into a Ziploc, store it for the year, and then take it out next spring and do the same thing. What you send back to us is you take those microscope slides, put them back in the falcon tubes, and then you just send those back in this little bubble envelope. It already has a little slip, so I will email you the um, return shipping label the week that it's supposed to be returned, and then you just print that off, put it in here, drop it off on the Canada Post drop off. Um, and the data sheet. That's the other thing that goes in there. Uh, so the data sheet's pretty simple. It's just your contact information and mailing information, just in case something changes in between um, this year and next year when we have to get in contact with you. And then the trap information, so things like the trap number, um, the location of the trap, so your latitude, your longitude, um, and the date that you deployed it and the date that you removed it. And then on the back is a general comment section um, so that you can record things like um, but one thing we recommend is that you're going out at least once a week, maybe twice, uh, maybe every second week, something like that, just to check on the trap. If there was a significant wind event, you know, something might have fallen, broken it, um, things like that, to make sure that it's still in place. Um, but those are also things that you can comment in the general comment section. So, you know, you went back and one of the microscopes slide broke or, you know, that's why there's only three, or things like that. The slides are glass, so it could easily happen. Um, yeah, and if, like, you know, two weeks in, a tree falls on it and everything's broken, you can also send me an email and we can ship you a whole new kit. <laughs> um, anyone say anything? Uh, just move over the next part so that okay, cool. you think you're good. Okay, that's the kit. <laughs> So, like Rosa mentioned, um, the dates we have recommended for this this year is April 24th to June 24th. Um, that would be your set up and tear down date. If you can't go out on that exact date, that is okay, but try to keep it sort of within a six day buffer, three on each side if you can. Um, and that teardown date is fairly non-negotiable. Try to keep it up for two months if you can, can, but we ask that you get it in the mail to us by June 30th. All of this information is in the protocol. Hmm. And that's just because you're shipping these back to my lab in Sault Ste. Marie, where we are going to do an initial visual assessment of all of the slides. And then we are going to do the scraping of all of the Vaseline into the tubes. And then from there, all of them, all 52, I think it ends up being because we have two controls, um, are going to ship to the CFIA office in Ottawa, where they are doing the actual DNA extraction. 
Um, so if we don't get your trap samples back in time in early July, and they come in August or September, especially if you haven't notified us, everything's gone, everything's being processed, and we can't guarantee that we can still process them because it's been so long that um, there could no longer be DNA on your trap. So if you end up having to pull it down and you need to wait a couple of days to ship it, store it in your fridge, that would be great to keep it cold. Um, but we're making it as simple as possible for you to just print that out and you can just go to those red boxes on your street and drop them in. So it should be fairly simple. Um, and then we ask, if you don't, we have these available for anybody picking up a trap today. If you want to take a stand um, that we have used in the past, uh, you can take one of these. We can't ship these. So in the future, if you got more traps and we didn't have a way to drop it off to you, you'd have to get one of these or you can use a wooden stake in the ground. Um, there's many options. We just ask that for sort of consistency that you aim to have it between knee height and sort of chest shoulder height. That's easier for you to access it when you're setting it up and tearing it down. Keeps it a bit more consistent. So about 150 to 150 centimeters is our recommendation currently. Um, and then in the fall, once we have all of the data back, we will send everybody a summary of how the summer went. If you get a positive detection, you will hear from us much sooner. You will hear from us from Nicole immediately. Yes. <laughs> you will be in touch to come and take a look at property um, and see if she can confirm the um, DNA that we found, or if it was some sort of contamination, we have to figure that out on our end as well, obviously. Um, and then at that point, we're also hoping to put together a survey for you to answer to let us know what you thought of the community science project, if it was too complicated, if you'd be willing to do more in the future. Like I said, we find out that these tracks, we do really need to take your slides more often than letting you just have one set for two months that we might have to ask you to do that in the future. If you're willing to participate in next year, if you would want more traps for your site for next year, all of that information we're going to send with the summary in a survey. Um, but at any time, if you have questions, if you have comments, um, please feel free to reach out to Darissa. If you have questions for me, um, Darissa can put you in contact with me as well. Um, but I think that that's basically it. Um, if anybody has any questions about this project, go ahead now and yeah. Are all these slides available for us? These slides? Yeah. I'm currently, so long as technology is on my side, um, recording the slides in the presentation, but I don't quite know how like audio and slides have worked, but at the very least you have the slides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping to put it up on YouTube because there were there was a, a number of people who had reached out that weren't able to make either of the two workshops. We did the same thing yesterday as well. So um, that want the content. So I've been trying. <laughs> What sort of habitat characteristics do we look for when we're setting up the trap? Do we try to get it under the, one of the more mature trees because that would be the highest in the canopy where birds would land? Or are we looking for density? If there's a lot of young shoots, maybe not the biggest ones under there? So that's a great question. Um, I so Basically what we're recommending is, because everybody's sites are different. Some people only have a couple hemlocks, some have many. If you have a large area, um, we are recommending sort of focusing on that 50 meter buffer edge of the stand. Um, if you have a smaller stand that, like I said, has that, or I guess not 350 meter, it'll be 300. It's all in the protocol because it can reach 300 meters, but sort of the edge of the stand 300, 300 meters in is most likely where you're going to want to put it. Um, if you have smaller stands and then the center part because you can pick up from other areas. But yeah, I would recommend larger trees if you are choosing between like one side of your woodlot and the other side of your woodlot and one side has all of these tiny little brushy trees and the other side has some mature hemlock, those ones would probably be a better target. Yeah. Any other questions about the program itself? If you did want to um, create more of these traps for yourself, um, 
to use as interception traps and not to do the DNA part. There are a few ways you could go about it. So as far as I understand, Dr. Partridge is hoping to have the 3D printing files available on her website, which I can um, give to you at some point. If you want my email, I can give that to you and you can reach out. <laughs> Otherwise, the first iteration of these traps were like disposable plates with alligator clips and um, microscope slides. The only trick with these slides themselves when you are putting Vaseline on is you are not just using the Vaseline as is, you're using the Vaseline um, that has been sort of melted down on water, like water in a beaker, Vaseline on top, melt it down and that the water helps keep that temperature so that it's a really thin liquid, it'll look clear. Um, and then when you dip it in, you'll get a nice thin layer and it just keeps it from getting too much stuff in it, makes it cleaner for these purposes with the scraping that you don't have that much volume. And it's just a nice smooth edge to look at under a microscope as well. So if you did choose to do them, more of these just as interception traps, there are options. If you can't do 3D printing, you can MacGyver something like that or we can help you get the file and you can print them yourselves. I think it costs about $30 a trap from our local printer, um, but it, at the University in Michigan, um, they have their own printers. So they just buy the plastic it's themselves and it costs like $2 American per trap to make. So um, there are options available depending on your skill set. <laughs> and once the file is available, I'll be pretty quick, I think, to try and get it up on our website as well. So yeah, it will be widely available. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, yeah, just a thought. So why would you go to all the trouble to have one of those if you're not doing the DNA testing? And if anyone thought of just like a piece of plexiglass this size, put the Vaseline on it, and just use plexiglass. So we did get asked that yesterday. It is an option if you are wanting something that large to look at, and if you want to melt it down and like pour it over. The these are just it works the same like with the slides. They're easy to dip. Um, yeah. That I haven't worked out a way personally. I haven't tried to do that in a safe, clean, efficient way of covering a larger surface with the Vaseline. Um, there's so many crawlers that will fall out that you can typically pick it up um, if it's a sort of low to moderate infestation. If it's super new, um, that's where the DNA part comes in more, like much more handy because just a piece of wool can carry genetic material, so, or a leg or whatever. Like, it doesn't have to still be on the trap to pick up that material. Yeah. 